In 2016, the UK's vote to leave the European Union shocked the establishment. Eurosceptics were jubilant. Now that the unthinkable had happened, other countries would soon follow. Frexit, Dexit and Nexit were suddenly all on the cards. Plucky Britain had showed the power of taking back control. In recent years, the same populist sentiment that led to Brexit have seen the far right making sweeping gains across Europe, in France, Germany and Netherlands. Yet despite sharing similar views on immigration, they have been curiously quiet about leaving the EU. But there is a good reason. In 2016, in the aftermath of the Euro debt crisis and punishing austerity, support for the EU had fallen to an all-time low. However, as voters saw the political and economic turmoil of Brexit, support for remaining in the EU started to return. This is a story of how UK's disastrous Brexit provided an unexpected tonic for the European Union. As Brexit voters celebrated, the UK pound plummeted 13%. It reflected the market's view that the UK economic prospects were much worse outside the world's biggest trading bloc. What markets didn't expect at the time was that after the vote, leading Brexiteers would push for an ever more extreme Brexit. It wasn't enough to pursue a Norway-style deal with access to the single market. Flushed with success, their logical conclusion of a narrow 52-48 vote was to push for an ever harder Brexit. Leave the single market, leave the customs union, leave the Horizon space programme, the UK even turned down an opportunity to remain part of Erasmus, a cultural exchange allowing young people to study in Europe. But the problem was that the increasingly ideological Brexit was increasingly controversial back home. The referendum campaign suggested that Brexit would enable an extra £300 million a week for the NHS. But instead, consumers were noticing higher prices, lower investment, falling trade and slow economic growth. Since Boris Johnson won the election in 2019, promising to get Brexit done, the UK economy has slowed down. Real GDP per capita has barely grown. It's a worse period of economic growth in the post-war period. And whilst there are many reasons to explain low growth, Brexit certainly hasn't helped. Independent studies suggest Brexit has cost anything between 2 to 10% of GDP. Not a single study suggests Brexit has improved living standards. An average model suggests that the average Briton will be £2,300 worse off by 2030. This is a kind of outcome that any populist can understand. But it's much more than economic costs. The EU referendum was a simple question to a very tricky issue. Extricating yourself from 40 years of integration with the European Union was surprisingly difficult. Prime Minister Theresa May, the first to have a go, sent several votes to the House of Commons, but not a single one passed. The only thing British MPs could agree on is that they didn't like any of the choices offered. It seemed that, after all, you couldn't have your cake and eat it. The tragedy is that in the European Union, Britain had negotiated lots of special deals. Outside Schengen, outside the Euro, even a big rebate on the common agricultural policy. In the Brexit negotiations, the EU played a strong hand in dealing with Britain. Brexiteers had hoped the UK would be able to speak directly to different countries and pull on levers like the UK's big demand for German car exports. But the EU retained a unity of purpose in negotiations. It remained faithful to Ireland, with the Irish border proving a source of unexpected contention. Post-2016, there was to be no more special deals. Whilst the UK delegation often arrived badly prepared, the EU had a very clear and simple goal. Make sure countries were not rewarded for leaving the European Union. It's not rocket science, but the EU had no incentive to offer the best of both worlds. If you were going to leave a single market, that's fine, but don't expect the same benefits at the same time.
And the reality is that the negotiations were a far cry from the easy promises of a referendum campaign. As the economy slowed down and political instability increased, the British electorate quickly turned away from Brexit. Brexit is now hugely unpopular in Britain, with a big majority regretting leaving. It's rare to find someone under 40 or 50 who views Brexit as a big success. Boris Johnson may have won the 29 election on a premise to get Brexit done, but five years later and Brexit, the flagship policy of the Conservative Party, is barely mentioned. The problem is that after a period of stagnant wages and record immigration levels, it's very hard to answer the question, what exactly are the benefits of Brexit? From afar, the UK struggles with Brexit have been met with a degree of schadenfreude, the once stable and tolerant Britain becoming an angrier place of division. With lorries stuck in Dover, Brexit was an excellent advert for staying in the EU. Before 2016, Marine Le Pen's National Front openly toyed with leaving the European Union. Shortly after the vote, she said the British had seized the extraordinary opportunity to escape servitude. But eight years later, and the policy of Frexit is quietly forgotten, even as her party do very well in election. The French are increasingly pessimistic about both their economy and the future, but at least they can take some comfort from the fact that things are worse in Brexit Britain. Brexit was not without problems for the European Union. The negotiations were time-consuming and diverted attention from more pressing problems. The UK is a major trading partner with Europe and the impact on trade has damaged some EU firms. The biggest hit has been from UK exporters losing out, e.g. especially food manufacturers hit by new trade deals. But the loss of British cheese exports to Europe is barely noticed at all. It's not as if Europe doesn't have any other cheese producers. Despite the raft of economic problems of the UK, Brexit has been relatively minor for the European Union. In fact, it has also created some new opportunities, such as British firms relocating to the single market to avoid customs duties. There is even a risk of London losing its place as the dominant role for European finance. Brexit has also focused minds in Europe to plan a new European project without the recalcitrant Britain holding back integration. Some pro-Europeans were even glad that the UK had finally left because it often dragged its heels and opposed deeper integration. But this dream of ever closer European integration is not without new difficulties. Recent events have caused the problems of Brexit to appear relatively minor. The migrant crisis, the Ukraine war, the cost of living crisis have caused a new wave of anti-establishment feeling. So far this hasn't extended to wanting to leave the European Union, but there is still some fraying at the edges. Without the example of Brexit, it is possible that this wave of popular dissatisfaction would have gone more to the European Union and perhaps less to national governments. At the end of the day, Brexit is widely seen as a mistake, both in the UK and in Europe. It has dampened sentiment to leave the European Union. But as time passes, this will fade from view. The EU Commissioner Joseph Borrell said that Brexit was feared to be an epidemic but it has proved to be more of a vaccine. However, some vaccines can become less effective over time. Is the EU doing a good enough job? And why are countries like France experiencing a real economic crisis? This video looks into all the details.